out over the village, an ominously silent, utterly deserted village. This is the time the prisoner must make his bid for freedom, back to his homeland and his friends to many happy returns. What's the number of that car? Do tell me. I know every nut and bolt and cog. I built it with my own hands. Then you're just the man I want to see. I've been having a good deal of overheating in traffic. But now, no one will believe in his world of fantasy. Tell him our problem for You resign. You disappear. You return. You spin a yarn that Hans Christian Andersen would reject. I also have a problem. I'm not sure which side runs this village. The past is unreal, the future uncertain, unless he can find his prison, the place they called The Village. Don't miss this next suspense-filled episode of The Prisoner. There it is. Welcome again to another episode of The Prisoner here on Channel 54. I'm your host, Scott Appel, video critic for the San Jose Mercury News. Tonight's episode, entitled Many Happy Returns, is one of the most unusual episodes in this unusual 17-part series. The beginning of the program, for instance, has almost no dialogue, and McGowan himself doesn't speak until halfway through the show. But when he does speak, his words are quite revealing of his personality. He says not, where am I, but where is this place? He knows where he is, just like he knows who he is. Many Happy Returns is also a particularly interesting episode because it's here that we finally get some details about our hero's life before he became the prisoner. We get acquainted with his former superiors, his old apartment, his custom-built Lotus 7, and his birthday. The fact that McGowan gave the prisoner his own birthday gives you some idea of how much he must have identified with the character he was portraying. And because of the strong identification between the actor and his role, we thought it would be fitting to present a short biography of Patrick McGowan tonight. So we'll get to that after the episode. Many happy returns. Where am I? In the village. What do you want? Information. Whose side are you on? That would be telling. We want information. 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 You won't get it. By hook or by crook, we will. Who are you? The new number two. Who is number one? You are number six. Welcome back, my friends, to an all-new episode of Once Upon a Village, a Prisoner podcast. I'm your number two here, controlling the destiny of all of you as you listen to this podcast. John is Drew, and I am joined, as we have since the very beginning, by our own number six himself, writer-editor Jim Beard. Hey, Jim. Hey, I, uh, I, I woke up on the wrong side of the village <laughs> <laughs> today. And, and and I'm ready for some some fisticuffs. You ready for some fisticuffs okay. over this one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, as I said to you just a little while ago, I've I've got issues with, <laughs> with this episode. I, I, all right, and I, I, I'm going to just put the question out there, and then like you don't have to answer it now. We can answer as we go. Is, are your issues in the way that you feel cheated? Not ch- not cheated. It's it's there's things about this episode that 
really bug me on on an intrinsic level. Okay. I think we can agree that it, that it's well done, just like any episode. You know, it's it's well done and, and all of that. But as we go along, uh, when we first started this podcast, I mentioned I think I mentioned that there was an episode that I had quite quite an issue with, and uh, it turns out that it's this episode. Okay, all right. Yeah. I don't have an issue with it, other than it is probably the most. On prisoner episodes so far that we've covered, save for possibly the very ending. I, I can kind of agree with that. And, and you know what? I'm going to freely admit here that and many times when we've we've all the podcasts that we've done together on, on sh- different shows, it, it usually comes down to it's just me. You know, <laughs> like I have a problem with something and nobody else tends to have a problem with it. But. But you know what? If we just said, "Oh yeah, it was a good episode," and things happened, then we would have a two a two minute podcast, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but hey, but to stretch it out a little bit more, I have another book on the show that I found. Oh, okay. Yeah, this one is called "The Prisoner." Bum bum bum. <laughs> uh, the Prisoner Televisionary Masterpiece, and it is actually i guess it was originally printed in france it's it says in the beginning translated from the french oh okay and then it says english edition text textual verification and it has a credit to a person it was originally published in 1990 and then this edition that i have which is the english version was published in 1995 and in in england I'm trying to remember where we got this, and I don't really remember. But what's really fascinating is it has in the beginning of the book it has an interview with Patrick McGowan, hmm. specifically for this book, and it was that he really wanted to be included in this book, and that he insisted on going over the transcript of the interview that was conducted with him and uh, approve everything and make corrections and, and all of that. There's two, two quotes from him that I think are, are very interesting and, and sort of germane to what we're doing. If you want to indulge me here for a moment, go right ahead. They asked him at first about, it says after 20 years of debate and speculating about what you are supposed to have said in the prisoner, do you think the time has come to say what you really said? (laughs) This answer is very interesting. He says, I don't particularly enjoy talking about it. I finished with the series after editing it and delivering the last episode and would just as soon leave it alone. Hmm. The work, if it can be called that, is done and should stand or fall on its merits or otherwise. Explanation lessens what the piece was supposed to be, an allegorical conundrum for people to interpret for themselves. If one gives answers to a conundrum, it is no longer a conundrum. So that there's some food for thought in there. And I've always kind of agreed with that sort of with that sentiment that the more you explain things that perhaps weren't really supposed to have an explanation the, it becomes sort of unmagical i was going to say my takeaway actually it's interesting cuz you're 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 focusing on the end part there and i'm focusing on the part where he says the the work if you can call it that or something like that you know yeah. that that phrase there and i'm like thinking is there a little bit of sort of it's, angst about this series, and not just because people would continually ask him till he yeah. passed, but just in general. And I say that because here's the thing. This is an interesting one. We're doing many happy returns. This is George Markstein's last episode as story editor. He okay. left the series after this because he was uh, at, at odds with McGowan on how the series should end. Correct, yeah. And it's funny because he actually is in the episode, too. Yes! Well, that was one thing we never pointed out. That's him in the episode, and that's him in the opening credits each week. Right. He's the he's the guy that the, he, that, um, the prisoner delivers his uh, resignation to. Correct. Um, you know what else is in that statement is what, what is known as objectivism. And 
for the comic book fans out there in the audience, they may recognize that that was uh, what Steve Ditko was a great believer in, the famous writer, uh, artist Steve Ditko, that he believed that once he did the work, that was it. The work speaks for itself. There was no reason for him to speak about it. And that's how he got into his whole thing about that he, you know, stopped talking to people, basically. He didn't do interviews and, you know, live a somewhat secluded life away from fandom. I've gotten this impression from Magoon before that he's that same sort of person. Once he's done with a project, he moves along. Mm -hmm. And he's not the kind of person to sit there at later and talk about it because it, the work is there, you know, the work is viewable and, and he, it doesn't, he, he doesn't believe he needs to sit there and explain it and talk about it later on when he's moved on to other things. That's my uh, kind of takeaway from, from that. I'm saying all of this and reading this quote. It's funny because here we are doing a podcast right. where now we're not, trying to necessarily uh, give a definitive explanation for everything that happens in these episodes. I think but most, we are two guys who are sitting here asking questions like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. You know, or why is that the way that is? Which I think is okay. I don't think we're uh, ruining the conundrum of, of it at all. We're not, if we are giving any sort of answers, it's just our opinion. Right. You know. Right. Right. I think right. I think most fans would probably be upset if we tried in any way to say we're going to get to the bottom of this and define it. Uh, and, and this is going to be it. I um, agree, especially with this show. There's one other quote that I'd like to read, and it's towards the end. And I hope you'll enjoy this one. E- they asked, they said to him, each episode of The Prisoner had a theme or statement on education, politics, whatever. Wouldn't it have been interesting to have made more to cover further themes? Listen to what McGowan says. No, on the contrary, I think seven episodes would have been the ideal number. Less would have been more, more enigmatic. There are seven I consider completely true to the concept. Mm. The others on occasion were stretching it a bit. Hmm. I would love to know if he ever came out and told anybody what the seven episodes out of the 17 were that he believed should have been the show. And anything past that was sort of stretching it a bit. I'd like to think that this particular one that we're going to talk about is not part of the seven. Because <laughs> it wouldn't be part of my seven. In fact, as we go along, here I'm going to say something right now and we can get into it more, but... I would prefer to ignore this episode and say it never happened. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I can't I can't go that far. Okay. That's I cool. I mean, I, you know what? We don't always agree. Mm-hmm. We don't always agree, right? It's it's a daring episode in many respects because yeah, Oh, I completely agree. And I think they dared too much. <laughs> I, and uh, very seriously, I think they dared too much and went too far. And to me, it, you know what? Maybe this is one of the ones that he's referring to. To me, it runs the risk of ruining the entire concept of, hmm. of the show. So, Interesting. So, yeah, keep that in mind. You know, and again, we've disagreed in the past. You like King Tut. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's true. That's yeah. true. Well, let's let's get into this one. It's it's called Many Happy Returns, uh, written by Anthony Skeen. And directed by Patrick McGowan, actually, using the pseudonym Joseph Surf. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He likes his pseudonyms, doesn't he? <laughs> he does. He does. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's an interesting last name, Surf, you know, serving a greater power. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. I love the title of this episode because this is what you say to people upon their birthdays. Right. And I didn't make the connection at first. Yeah. You say happy birthday and many happy returns. Yeah. I didn't make that connection. That's why yeah. actually the ending was a twist for me. I, 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 and I guess maybe that's why it's like, I've forgotten about that. And I enjoyed the ending. Everything yeah. else leading up to it. Yeah. It's a bit 
at times a bit of a, even I'll say it a slog, but yeah, I did. I did. Oh, I, I agree. Oh, yeah. I think this episode could have been shortened. Oh yeah. By how much, uh, you know, uh, uh, it could almost have been a half hour episode, you know, mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, it could have been, a, you know what? It could have been like a, a, a 30 minute danger man episode, <laughs> you know, something like that. Or they could have just gotten rid of it all together. Wow, jeez. Well, boom. well, <laughs> let's let's talk about it here. Uh, aired okay. November tenth, nineteen sixty seven in England. July twentieth, nineteen sixty eight in the United States. Now, here's the thing. You're right um, because I actually, for a while there, when it opened up, I was taking meticulous notes, and I stopped after a while with certain parts of this because I was like. We do not need to go into this detailed, uh, as I think we said, either here in the, at the beginning of the episode or before we started, but I'll say it again. There isn't a whole lot of nuance to this story. It opens, yeah. first of all, ver- at the very beginning, we've got our opening with, you know, where am I in the village? And we had even said that our number two was going to be a woman in this episode, in our last episode. And all of a sudden it's a male voice. Yeah. I, so I should have, I should have said then, spoiler alert. Right. <laughs> Right. Um, well, that, that threw that's me. The, that's the funny thing about this opening is it, it's a foolie on, on purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the only episode where the number two who speaks in the beginning is not actually the number two in the episode. Right. Uh, his name is Robert Wrighty, uh, a voice actor who appeared in, in various television shows, including Space 1999 and Doctor Who, doing voice work for them. Of um, course he did. Of course he of did. Of course he was in Doctor Who. <laughs> was, uh, was he in Six Million Dollar Man? Too? No, he wasn't. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and this is how I'm going to do it. There's certain stuff I'm just going to sort of throw it to you, Jim, and ask you a question about it. Because here's All the right. thing. The show opens, our prisoner awakens, and he goes to run his shower, finds the waters. Wait, stop. What? Who wears a watch to bed? <laughs> right see I, now, that was my first note that i wrote see this is now how i'm telling you you're like you know trying to find things that, trying to find some nuance in what is not a very nuanced who wears right. a watch to bed <laughs> but that bugged me like he literally wakes up and looks at his watch <laughs> No, you keep a clock by the bed, you know, or it's, it's visible. Yeah, I guess if you're going to bed too quickly and 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 you don't take your watch off, but who wears a watch to bed? Well, obviously a spy does. I right. Guess. Yeah. <laughs> and and we find the water's not running, the electricity's not on, the music isn't playing on the music box. He yeah. steps outside, and from the looks of it, the entire village is deserted it's just quiet except for the birds you know the Wait. seagulls no no there's more than that the, the, to hammer the point home that it's desolate they give us the desolate sound effect <laughs> which is that you know the wind right yeah that's been used in film and television since the beginning of film and television you know <laughs> uh, to 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 really hammer the point home that there's nobody around, and we're gonna play the desolate sound effect. But that's the thing. If it if that's all you did, there we could have cut it. I didn't clock in how long it is before he starts making his moves. But he wanders the village for quite some time. And I'm just gonna throw out the first question to you, Jim. What did you know? Like, was there anything there that stood out that it's like, okay, that was a good move, but it's like we could have done without this. Oh, okay. Um, wait. Here is my thought, and I made a note to myself at this point. This is going to harken back to what we have talked about pretty much in every episode, which is this: all the people are gone, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Th- th- that means everybody in the village is in on this. Yep. And we've talked about this. There's a switch. I guess, or something that they can do this to everybody all at once. It's some kind of blanket thing to that that everybody in the village goes along with whatever scheme number one and number two are up to at any given time. But this is a big one. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, where are they? 
Uh, my assumption is they're down in the tunnels, maybe, you know? I can't believe they moved every single person out of the village completely. Overnight. Yeah, overnight. Yeah. Um, or, uh, it, you know, is it another hypnotism thing on number six? You know, because the dynamics of moving everybody out overnight w- is too much. But but again, it, I, it, it's one. It's this whole thing about they can do this and, ev- and make everybody in the village in on something. And what's interesting again is that this is all for one man. Yep, one man. So that that's my thought. Yeah, he probably they, we see him wandering around quite a bit. I guess it was it, it, we're supposed to believe that. Again, he can't believe anything. He's to the point where he must disbelieve everything he sees and experiences until he uses, you know, the scientific method uh, of checking and rechecking. And, and he does, and he goes everywhere and, you know, looks at everything. And if I was him and in the position that he's in, I probably would do the same thing. I, I would not believe it. I, it's like you would think that the first thing he would do is jump in the car or whatever those things are, you know, the little carts and and get the hell out of there. But he probably thinks that the moment he goes, you know, a half mile that they that Rover appears and stops him. You know, why bother? What I would have really liked to have seen is is him looking for the helicopter. Yeah, there you go. But there's probably no way they were going to leave a helicopter, you know, there for him. The other thing that I want to throw out here is that it is a fairly haphazard way to do what they, they do to him. Because... How did they know what he would end up doing exactly? You know, I guess they knew, they figured that he's fond of trying to make a boat. Well, right, exactly. If this if this takes place after... Chimes of Big Ben. Right, if it does. Yeah. And see, that that's where I've got some questions, too, because think about it. There's similar plots in that regard, because there's still also the question of, wait a minute, you showed up. This looks suspicious. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I love that you said that. It, it, the plots are similar, but I'll I will offer that Chimes of Big Ben is this plot done well and acceptable to me. <laughs> whereas this and the way it, the way things go is is not acceptable to me. And and, and I'll get into that more as we go along. <laughs> yeah, I I, did, I think Chimes of Big Ben may have been done better, but. Yeah. But I also have to question then which one comes first, because we talked about at the end of Chimes of Big Ben, at that point, he realizes his own people are in on this. Here in this episode, he gets home, he talks to his people. Mind you, it's different people. So my thinking is this should be coming before. I will agree with you, and and, you really jumped ahead there, (laughs) But yeah, that's one of my my problems, and and you know I don't know if you want to go into it now or wait till we get to that we can, point. We can wait till we we can wait till we get okay. to that point. Yeah. But yeah, that is one of my problems. But we we know that Chimes of Big Ben was both made before this one, right, and aired before this one, right. So I have to believe. But mm-hmm. there's also some talk about time in here that makes me believe that maybe that's not true. That may actually help me to accept parts of this better mm-hmm. if if I was to believe it happened before Chimes of Big Ben. Right. But then again, if Chimes of Big Ben comes after this, I don't I think he would have been even more skeptical about getting away. Right. You know, hmm. but anyway, <laughs> so, I mean, you're saying if this was after Chimes of Big Ben, if this yeah. Is after, yeah, he would be definitely skeptical after everything that happened to him in Chimes. That's the thing. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, uh, that's why, again, I could go on and be perfectly fine if Many Happy Returns was said to be not non-canonical, you know, <laughs> it, or just a complete, utter delusion 
you, you know, because uh, uh, parts of it just don't make sense to me or, or just sit very poorly with me. Okay. All right. Well, see, here's the thing. Once he's done his inspection, even going to number two's house and all, finding everything, uh, uh, you know, non-functional there, he yeah. decides to start making his escape. He starts building a boat. This time, though, it's a raft. It's not a yeah. boat made out of a big tree, you know, log and stuff. It's it's a bunch of smaller, you know, put together, and he's got oil barrels that he uses for flotation and stuff. He goes into the store, takes himself supplies, food, map, a camera, which I thought was interesting because he then goes around and takes pictures of the village. That's re- that's a really cool point. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I actually like that little bit. Well, here, why did he leave a, a IOU note? Yes. Was that just Was that just his... You know, uh, innate sarcasm there, Maybe. like, uh, you know, or, or cause he, cause he knew at this point, he, that's why he's taking photos. He knew he was going to come back, but not as a prisoner, mm. you know, his always- intention all along. And he's, he said it in other episodes. I am going to leave, and I'm going to come back and blow this place off the map. Yep. You know, he's not just going to leave it alone. Right. And, and that's the whole thing. He's taking evidence yes. with him. Taking evidence. Because he knows it's going to be a hard sell. hmm He so. also takes one of the radios. Yep. Which, at first, I'm like going, they probably aren't going to work outside of the village. But then we mm-hmm. see, because he, he finally makes the raft... He shoves off. There's some bad filming. Lagoon did, I, I, you know, it's funny. And I, I it's because he directed this episode. But there's a part there at one point where he's floating. You can s- clearly see the rocks at the bottom. It's not that deep of water. Right. I, okay. I was like, come on. That, that was just badly <laughs> done. But he does take the radio, strip it of the magnetic components inside to create a compass. Yeah, I could but, never have done that. Yeah. See, that, that's one thing, though, too. We also see just how competent he is. He's able to MacGyver things. He's able to, you know, he builds his boat. He's got his magnet going and, and all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's a jack of all trades, you know. Yeah. You know, he's he's the man. Yeah. Yep. He also keeps a journal. We never see what he actually writes other than the day numbers, in which he's he's got five days, seven days, 18 days. Uh, and as he's writing, we see through the, you know, it's a series of, you know, what do they call them? Like a montage. He's getting right. more and more tired. You know, he's getting right. more. Yeah, because, yeah, like his writing gets huge, you know. <laughs> Here's me screaming at him, like, preserve the, the space that you have. You're going to run out of paper, dude. Because <laughs> he only took one uh, copy of the Tally Ho. Yeah, yes, right. <laughs> now... Okay, so there's that part. It's it's the village going through it. It's the escape. Now we get to the next, like, and it's another big, weird section because he, and as we find out later on, he only slept four hours a day. So that's going to have its toll on you after a while when you're trying to keep the boat steady and on a course and all that. Right. He passes out from exhaustion, all right? And he's found by this passing boat. And, you know, at first I couldn't understand. It's like, why are these guys stealing his stuff and tossing him overboard? We'll find out later. But, you know, just how, what kind of guys they are. I thought it also interesting that when they toss him over, we clearly see he's awake and somewhat alert. But he lets them do it so that he can sneak back on board. Right. It's a whole, it's a ruse. Yes. You know, of course. The, the whole boat sequence is done well. I think it conveys some good tension, you know, you because yep. you know it begins with him being thrown over the, uh, the side of the raft. You don't know that he's. It's sort of a ruse, and you go, "Oh my gosh, you know that's not good." And these these bastards stole, you know, all of his stuff, that all of his evidence, you know. Yep. And all of that, but then you fi- we we find out right, yeah, he no, he is awake and he gets on board their boat, but that's still tense, you know. He's up against two guys. He himself has had virtually no sleep, not very nutritious food to eat, and and all of that. He's not at his best, and he's got to try to take a boat away from two hardened criminals, and, armed. 
criminal. Ar- well, armed, and as we quickly see, because he's you know sneaks around and he finds out they're gun runners, German gun runners at that. German gun runners, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boy, it's not bad enough that they're gun runners, <laughs> but they're German. Gun well, it, it, it was funny because at first, like I'm listening to the dialogue and everything, and I'm like going, "Is that German?" <laughs> And then, of course, later on, they make the reference that they are German. So I just wanted to, you know. And then, of course, obviously, like with names like Ernst, I guess I should have picked up on that. By the way, just here's our Doctor Who connection for this episode, our real one here. Ernst, played by John Lorimore, appeared as Count Frederico in the Tom Baker uh, story, The Mask of Mandragora. Okay. Yep. So. Good, <laughs> good. There, there's our number two there's for a- our Doctor Who <laughs> uh, Like I said, he finds the cache of guns. He then goes into the kitchen and starts a fire, smothering it out quickly to create smoke. It distracts the men. He does, and here's the thing, like you said, exhausted, though, he still ha- is the better one. He manages to take them out one at a time, tie them up, lock them in their room by chaining the door shut, and then... Off he goes with the boat. And you think at first, all well and good. But even then, you can see the exhaustion is still getting to him because there's moments there where he's kind of like listing a little bit as, as, he's, as he's navigating the boat and such. But he right. sees off in the distance the flashing light. Right. And, and you know what? I mean, it's important to this whole thing because if he was at the top of his game, he, he might have done a better job of containing yes. the two guys. You Ac- know. Absolutely. And as it, as it happens, they get loose. They get loose. They're not able to break down the door because it is chained shut, but what they manage to do is smash through the cupboard in the room to the adjoining room and go through the cupboard there so that mm-hmm. they are able to, again, jump him Another fight breaks out, but again, it's it's like he's holding his own and he's fine until one of them grabs a gun and starts shooting, so he has no choice but to make right. a swim for it. Yeah, he feels that he's close enough to land that he that he can make it. Now, here's the thing: the whole time, only dialogue we get are the two Germans in German. Yeah, that's it. Very, yeah, yeah. This and- whole time. The whole, the whole time in the episode, no dialogue. No dialogue at all. In now, English. he swims, like I said, for it. We fade to him now on shore, and he's awakening. So at some point, maybe he passed out from the swimming and was washed ashore. Yeah. I don't know. But, but there he is, finds himself on this beach, starts, you know, heading up the hillside there, um, where he meets this man walking a dog. And this is now where we finally get our first words from 23 minutes into the episode. Where is this? This is a really good fooly part of the episode because it just so happens that the first people on land that he talks to don't speak English. Mm-hmm. And you don't really have any idea what the heck these pe- people are doing, who are they, and you know, what is going on and why are they so weird and all, and all of that. And we, we, it, as it turns out, they're gypsies. Yes. Or, or Rom. And I think they say, they don't say, they say, no, it's Rom something. I can't remember how they say it. Rom, 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 Romney or Romney, however that's said. But they do, they do say it in there that, uh, and, and and he finds out. Bum bum bum. Masidi, Moski, Spider Chow. Asu, Allen Shopre. Dad, don't do me. Masidi, Moski, Spider Chow. Tell him. Chichero se. Finchin ke no. Don't do me. He finds out he's in England. Oh, well, he finds out he's in England once they direct him to yeah. the road. He jumps on board a truck and the truck takes him to, you know, London. He wakes up in London when he hears a police car going and he panics. So he jumps out of the truck and he's like smack dab in the middle of London. Yeah. Now that's all fairly. I'm trying to think of the you know the word coincidental. Right. 
You know, it's a hell of a coincidence that the a they wherever he washed up was near London. You know, and he got he got there fairly easily, and well, then jumps out, and he's right in the middle of London too. Well, you know? I, I'll I'll give that one. I I can give them because as they'll explain later on, because we're actually going to find relatively where the village is located in this episode. Uh, yes, and they we're we're starting to get into the dicey parts of. This okay, for me. <laughs> but you see, that's why I th- I have no issue with them him winding up in England. Oh, okay, London maybe necessarily I don't know, but you know, yeah. okay, uh, that might have been a bit too much of a coincidence, too on the nose. But still, I can accept that he finally winds up there in in some capacity with the way okay. he was yeah, the way no, he was that, traveling. That's not so that's not so bad. That's nothing compared to the beefs that I other beefs. <laughs> I have. So, in, in being in London, I, I, now again, I because other than that dialogue and, and a few other words he says to the gypsies, we still get no dialogue. Instead, he decides to make his way without any, again, anybody to talk to about it. He goes home. He heads to his home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as we can see, somebody else now owns the house. At first, he's met by the maid who tells him the mistress is not at home. But yeah. as he walks off, he sees his car pull up and a woman gets out of the car. And he, Did you notice the number on his door? Number one. Oh. It's number one. Number one. Yeah. Is that foreshadowing? <laughs> I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Maybe that's why uh, Mark Steen left. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> or, um, I, I mean... I'll say it in a little bit, but I or there's another theory that could be considered for that too. But mm-hmm. go on. He engages the woman, speak, starts speaking to her. What's the number of that car? Uh, terribly interesting. K A R, one hundred and twenty C. What's the engine number? Do tell me. 461034TZ. I know every nut and bolt and cog. I built it with my own hands. Then you're just the man I want to see. I've been having a good deal of overheating in traffic. Perhaps you'll care to advise me. Come here. And what's interesting, that seems to infuriate him more, is that somebody has his car, not that somebody has his house. Because as he points out, I <laughs> built that car. I know every part of it. Yeah. We, you should also, we should also note that we have seen this woman before, too. Yes. This is uh, the actress uh, Georgina Cookson. Yes. She was from in From uh, A, B, and C. A, B, and C. Yep. Yep. Yeah. She introduces herself to him as Mrs. Butterworth. Maybe that's where people got got the idea that Mrs. Butterworth was British. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I've heard some people say, Mrs. Butterworth, I thought that was a British person anyway. It does sound like a very British name. Right. <laughs> yeah, Butterworth. But she says she's Mrs. Butterworth. He, the prisoner, introduces himself as Peter Smith, and he says it so hesitantly, you know he's just making it up off the top of his head. I, I just read something somewhere that in one of the books or whatever where it's supposed that it may actually be his real no, name. No, no, no. Yeah, tell me, right. You know no. damn well it's not. <laughs> oh, you know, and here's the thing. Now we get into his house. And at first I was like, oh, my God, mind blown. The, the house layouts and the way they designed the rooms and stuff – is similar to the village. That must be the style in London. And then I realized there was that episode with um, number eight, where they like made her home look like her home in in her home country. So they must right. have done the exact same thing to the prisoner. It is supposed to be like that, right? I didn't, I, I didn't make that it connection, is, and I read that too. No, it it it's not exactly conveyed very well, but it is supposed to be that in Arrival, when he wakes up, he thinks he's in his own home still, right? Until he looks out the window, right? Right. So yeah, I guess it is. It's supposed to be that he's living in a place that looks like his own home. Oh, it, in it, London. I mean, the layout isn't the same because, as we know, he comes down from the kitchen area into the yeah, living room area. There's yeah. the door, the swinging door. But still, 
if you look at it, um, the, the, the recessed bookshelves in the shape they're in, the television yeah. is there, the, the tiger, the tiger skin the rug is on the rug. floor. The yeah. couch is yep. there. Yeah. Right. You know? Right. In fact, he makes it a point to linger in the prisoner's home in, on the, in the village. He, McGowan makes it a point to linger on that so that it's almost like you look and you are like, wow. Okay. Cause I never noticed the couch until this episode. Hmm. Okay. You know, it's an interesting dynamic here with these two because. Oh yeah. Did you think she was flirting? Y- yeah. Um. John, this is this episode. It it puts me through the ringer because as many problems that I have with it, or it's not. I don't have many. Pro- I have a couple of very big ones to me. Right. But. There is also things that I do like, and that makes it more difficult to con- when I consider the things that I don't like. I like her. Yes. I like her character. Mm-hmm. I like all her interactions with him. It's all very fun, and you do want it to be real. You would hope. That or you would like it to be that he has a a very weird and odd ally in her, right? To give him shelter, he can wash up. She gives him clothes. Yep. She gives him the car. Yeah, the (laughs) car. She doesn't throw him out. She answers his questions. She shows him private documents when Mm -hmm. he asks for them. Yep. You know, the the car log, the lease. Yep. All this, you know, stuff. Here's one of the problems. He says something ha- happened 12 months ago. Right, in the bathroom. Right. What did he, was it dry rot? Dry rot in the wall in the bathroom. And he points okay. out also how the, the hot and cold water uh, taps are, are mixed up and all that. Yeah. And he does it as a means to try and prove, because the thing is, the lease, he notices, yeah. is brand new, as though this is a first-time tenant and not a conti- like somebody else just picking up the lease, which I yeah. guess is the way they handle that in, in London, in England. This is the seventh episode. That we've shown, you know, that have was shown that we've talked about seven episodes, right? Right. Since he was taken, abducted. Look back over all those episodes, and to me, there's no way that twelve months that all of that fits in twelve months. Well, a s- or if it does, then it's just twelve months, and that means that the whole thing about the repairs in the bathroom and the dry rot. Happened right before he resigned. What? Wait, there was one. What's the episode? What? It's Chimes of Big Ben. Where isn't it? Like six? Is it six weeks pass? Right. With his traveling, you mean, or no? In Chimes of Big Ben, what's the thing where he's told that they have six weeks until the art show? Oh, right. Okay, but even more time passes in that episode. Look, that's two months right there alone. Mm-hmm. I, I find it hard to believe that 12 mo- – that's why I could almost go with you with, it, with it, the thinking that this happens earlier mm-hmm. than what what the order that we're, we're given. Right. I don't know. I that that's one of the. This is one of the things that starts to bug me about this episode. That doesn't seem right to me. I just looked at it as when he said twelve months. I because I I was doing that too. I was like, is that twelve months since he's been captured and and it, that happened recent, or was it twelve months somewhere along the line? And it could be early on, and he just never got around to fixing it. No, no, I think he said the repairs were done 12 months ago. No, that's the thing. He said he didn't say anything about the repairs being done. Oh. She said, I took care of all that. And she kind of laughs it off like, you silly boy, like, you know, you should have gotten it done. Okay. That's why I was willing to accept. He knew these problems were there. He never okay. fixed them. That's my okay, take. But, well, re- wait, regardless, he still says 12 months ago. Right. So 12 months ago, he was 
in London, not abducted, you know, not yet a prisoner. True. Okay. Before this episode, 12 months. Okay. To me, it's that's stretching it. It's I think it's too tight. Unless this happens, this episode actually happens much earlier in the timeline of him being a prisoner. I, I, I could village. I could accept that. I could accept. Okay. I, could, I could accept okay. that. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to accept it at all. <laughs> do whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, so she gives him the car. <laughs> she gives him the car, and we get. Don't forget to come back. Quick scene, it's like, oh my gosh, look at this. The theme is playing, and he's driving the car, and, yeah. and everything's cool, and he gets back to the place, and he meets our man. Anyone at home? Mark Steen there. And <laughs> Here's where we begin the big problems with this episode. Okay. You you brought it up earlier, and 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 maybe there is an out, but but why in the world? If this episode happens after Chimes of Big Ben, why in the world would he go back to his former bosses? Because he knows his former bosses are in on it. If this happens after Big Ben. I think it does. Okay. I, I'm I, game to put this one as before it. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm game um, to put this one as before it. Okay. And what the other thing is, is that I don't care for, is that it's a different set of bosses yes. in the two episodes. Which is right? why, which is why I would be like, if you're going to say this comes after, okay, I'd be fine with that because instead of those two, although then we needed to have some sort of no. explanation and be careful of, you know, what's his name and what's his name. So yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no way that they wouldn't have said or. I I don't think if this happens after Chimes of Big Ben, he would not have gone back to his off the offices, bosses, anything. Right. He he would he would assume that no matter what, they're all in on it, and mm-hmm. he couldn't do it. He's what he thinks he's going to go back and get resources to return to the village. There, there would have been nobody he could have trusted at all. If this happens before Chimes of Big Ben, then in Chimes of Big Ben, right, they would have had to have said, you've already been back once, mm. and now you're showing up again? You know? See, maybe not necessarily, not necessarily, you know, in that regard. And also because there was there was the whole thing with Thorpe and the Colonel, and they're also playing the whole, you know, you disappeared, you know, and now you're back yeah. sort of thing yeah. with with him, just like the other two did in Chimes. Right. Although Chimes, they played it up more, the whole idea that maybe he defected. Oh, that was, right. oh, wait a minute. There, there's my question, though. Regardless of how this places, before or after, yeah. do you think... Unlike the other two in Chimes of Big Ben, do you think Thorpe and Colonel are in on this? Do you want to get into this right now? I mean, why not? We're, we're talking with answer. them now. I will give you my answer. My answer is, once all is said and done, no. Good. I do not believe they are in on it. Okay, good. I don't either. Um, I don't either. And here's here's why. Of course they don't believe him to begin with. I wouldn't either. But what they do is what they should do. They check it out. Yes. They check his story. And we get a montage of them checking it out, including yes. going to talk to Mrs. Butterworth, yep. right? Yep. If they were in on it, they we wouldn't have seen any of that. And they wouldn't have had any reason to go to Mrs. Butterworth. Right. 
because spoiler alert, she's in on it. Yes, she's in on it. So no, unless it's one of these goofball things that the writers didn't think about and and stick this sequence in there when that's not what they had intended. Uh, like, um, what's the episode that I'm thinking of? Um, the uh, what's the one where I I think there's a gaff because we get um, number two who knows what's going on is is acting. It's Times a Big Ben. Times a Big Ben. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Where I think they ruin that by by he's surprised that Nadia is, is a swimmer and mm-hmm. all this stuff, which is total BS because he knows that all of, you know, he shouldn't be surprised by anything because they're all in on it. Right. Yeah. It's the same thing with, with this one. And it's either a big mistake or... Our our bosses in this episode are not in on it, and I really truly believe that they're not. Mm-hmm. I agree, I and totally they do be, they do start to believe him, and and I and it's hard for me again because I like it after they start to believe him, and he starts working with them, and they bring in other guys, and they do all their planning thing, and there's even a fun little there's fun little jabs in there where he, where uh. Is it Thorpe calls? He no, calls it's, him it's the Star. it's the Colonel. Yeah, or whoever, and he goes, "If you call me that again, I'm gonna kick your ass." Yeah, or basically, you know. Hey, by the way, th- we get the Colonel. Isn't the guy in Chimes of Big Ben called the Colonel? The the old man, right? right. That he's playing. So yeah, we have two different characters called the Colonel. Maybe which is. I, I find interesting and again somewhat troubling because we're obviously not supposed to believe that they're the same characters, right? Maybe maybe that's why though um, the prisoner takes a shining to the colonel in the village just because of the name and could you know. could be could yeah. be. By um, the way, can, can we agree on one thing at least? While you're getting all twisted <laughs> up about where this episode places now, I'm getting can we, I'm getting my dander up here. Can we oh, agree bye. that this at least takes place after free for all? Because in his talking about the village and everything, he brings up the fact that there was an election and he yeah. almost was elected. Oh sure. Okay, good. Uh, okay, <laughs> and then yeah, and then we start to have problems because we want to believe that free for all takes place after James of Big Ben. No, I, by the end of that, I was more willing to believe that Free For All took place sooner because oh, especially especially that whole bit right. there where he says any complaints and stuff like that, it, it uh, we, we I, I reappraised my – because I thought Chimes of Big Ben flowed nicely, but Free yeah. For All worked even better. You're right because Free For All was the second one filmed and Chimes of Big Ben is number five. Uh, Many Happy Returns is number 13. right. Of all things. This is why it's so troubling to me. They, there was no intention that this takes place at that time during writing and production and all that. There's no intention to, to my way of thinking that Many Happy Returns happens before it chimes a Big Ben. Why in the world number six thinks that he should go back to his bosses when he knows damn well that the village authorities are have you know are in infiltrated the the highest ranks of the british you know secret service spy organization whatever the hell it is mi6 well see that's if you're working if you're working from that position but then that would have made him want to say to those two you know, we've been infiltrated. There's another organization, all that stuff. None I of know. that, none of that is here. So to me, it makes yeah. more sense that many happy returns comes first. And he only learns about that. This isn't just, you know, th- whatever this organization is that's holding him. It's yeah. like every, they've got their fingers everywhere. Yeah. It, it doesn't work either way. <laughs> to me. It, 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 there's too many issues in here or scenes that we're not seeing it, it, either order you do it. There's needs to be scenes that refer to the other episode mm-hmm. in, in my opinion. Right. Um, this is still not my biggest issue with this. Okay. Episode. okay. Yeah, so By the way, did you, did you like the line also when they were looking at the pictures and they said, it looks like a resort place? 
<laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Har, har, hardy, har, har. Yeah. Very, very funny. Well, like you said, they, you know, work with him. After a while, they start, you know, coming over to his side and believing him and stuff. So they start working with him based on what, you know, and, and they, uh, that's why I was willing to say I can understand he winds up in England. Maybe London's a bit of a stretch, but England, because they work out based on his direction, the number of days, which we find out in the end was a 25 days in total. He was at sea that yeah. he winds yeah. up where he does and then makes his way uh, and yeah. winds up eventually in London. Um, so they, they narrow it down at the range and they figure that the village is located south of Spain and Portugal and west of Morocco. Yeah. So, okay. Oh, yeah. Here's the big one. Okay. You ready? This You're is sitting it. down. Go ahead. And I'm going to I am going to freely admit that this is me. It it's obviously not a problem to some people, but it's the complete deal killer to me. By the end of this episode, our guy, number 6, the prisoner, knows where the village is without a shadow of a doubt. Mhm. Uh, that's a total deal breaker as far as I'm concerned. I think that ruins the whole concept of this show. At the very end, the last episode, sure, great, wonderful. That would have been, you know, fitting. Not not at in the middle of the show. And that the village authorities allow it. Mm-hmm. When previously they have been scrupulous in making sure he doesn't know where the village is. And now all of a sudden, pretty much on a whim... With no plan that we can see, with no real uh, end game, <clears throat> they let him figure it out, and now he knows. Okay. I don't now, and uh, John, and I'm going to say it again. This is, I guess, it's a personal thing to me. I don't like this, especially since it was built up previously in this show that it's a secret. And it needs to be a secret from him. I don't. I don't like. I don't like it at all. And and for what? For very little return. Because by the end of this episode, you go, wow, a whole lot of stuff. You know, a time. Uh, the time invested in this. It could have gone many different ways. And, and for what? What was the end result of this episode mm-hmm. for the village the authorities? There may not see because we've been saying this. We've been saying there are escape episodes, there are information extracting episodes, and and mm-hmm. then there's that one episode that was really just about number two in the end. This one doesn't fit into any, yeah. There's escape, but it's not really escape. In in this case, it's it's definitely not an escape episode. I look at this as they threw him a bone. As, as we're going to find out very shortly, they threw him a bone for whatever reason, which then I could understand almost your theory that this should be later down the line, because it's like we've exhausted everything else. Maybe if we soften him up a little, maybe if we give him, throw them this bone. He, he got to spend some time yeah. in England. He got to eat, you know, non-village yeah. food and, and, and a proper cup of tea or whatever, because maybe the tea is terrible in the village. Who knows? You know, he got to drive I, his car and we got the great theme going and everything's going great. And, uh, you know, because what happens, he, he, he leads the search. Interesting fellow. He's an old, old friend who never gives up. He's the one navigating yep. while the pilot is there. And again, here's my, you know, and it's funny because you have a lot of issues. I don't. I think it's a serviceable enough episode. I could definitely see it not being in Magoo in 7. I think there's some directing choices here that are really clumsy and obvious and well telegraphed, including the one where his pilot is saying, I'll be right with you. And as he walks off, the milkman walks in. And it's like, okay. You know, and we find out that the pilot is actually, you know, working with the organization or whatever, because as they find the village, he sees it, like you said, finds it. Turns around. To be in Mombasa. There it is. We found it. That's it. Be seeing you. 
you, you know, even that's clumsily telegraphed because he reaches for the thing first and then turns around and says, be seeing you and all that, yeah. and then yeah. pulls it. And, of yeah. course, he's back in the village. I could see where people at this point would say, oh, the guys back in London are in on this because here's this guy and he's part of the village and he does the ejection seat. But no, I could see where, no, he, that guy comes in on his own, mm -hmm. you know. And, and gets in there um, because we already know that they've infiltrated different aspects of the British, you know, Secret Service or whatever you want to call it. I, I wish I could, and I'm being a writer, and it, it, that's horrible, but I wish I could put it into a, a, a better words of, of how deeply this, this bothers me <laughs> with this episode. I, I, I believe that for the course of this show... That the the whereabouts of the village, should, the secret should be maintained, and if anything, at the very end, and then it would be fitting, you mm -hmm. know. Right. I I'm gonna go back to this again. What was this all for? To soften him up? Uh, to I mean, again, I guess it's childish. You oh, dangle it's you dangle a carrot in front of. You know, a hungry horse, <laughs> a goat, whatever, and then and then snatch it away. Um, they've already done things to him that should have broken, you know, any other guy, and and it doesn't. They already sort of did this with Shimes of Big Ben because right. of all the time that passes in that. Yeah, and 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 they rip it away from him. I don't know. I could see somebody going, I don't know, number one, number two, whoever. They're having a meeting, and they'll go, wait, I got a good idea. Let's do that same thing, but we'll really let him get back to the real London. Mm -hmm. it's, and a then huge, it's a huge back, risk. And, we, and then we throw him in the, in the prison again, you know? <laughs> it's, and, a, and, it's a huge risk. It's a huge, it's huge. It's immense. Because at it least the other immense. one, it's, it's controlled. The whole thing is controlled the whole time. The only thing that screwed it up was because of a stupid watch. But this one, at any time, they don't know if he no. just goes off the off the radar and they and they lose him. I mean, it they even let him go gone, back into yeah to it his could people. Have gone so many ways. They're betting on one thing. He, that he has said in the village, I am going to escape and come back and, and wipe this off the map. Mm -hmm. That's what they're, go that's what they're trusting in is, is that right. But he's foiled them how many different times and, and you know, on, on information and, and everything else. Y you're right. It could have gone south and literally, how many different times? Um, I, you know, um, the guy, the German gun runners are not part of it, right? Are they? I don't. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, I, they would. They wouldn't have tried to kill him. That's true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The gypsies are not part of it, and as I believe, the bosses in London are not part of it either. The only. People that are part of this, and spoiler alert, because we're very close to the big boom, boom, boom. Mrs. Butterworth, yes, is Mrs. in on it. She's in on it because you know he gets back to the village, like we said. He starts walking around, and again, it's still. And this is so weird. This is the weird part because he's walking around, and it still sounds. We even get the deserted sound effect, like you you mentioned at the beginning here. He yeah. goes into his house, yeah. the water goes on, the electricity kicks in, the music yeah. starts, the door opens, and Mrs. Butterworth walks in, and we find out she's number two, and she's got the birthday cake she promised to make him for his birthday. Yeah. Now, just this scene I really like. I wish it was part of a different episode. <laughs> it is really effective – it is very surreal because if you were watching this for the first time back in 1967 and you had no idea that Mrs. Butterworth was in on it, mm -hmm. 
not only is she in on it, she is number two. She's wearing the badge. Look, he's in there. He's in his home. All the shit comes back on, right? And the door opens up. And who of all people but Mrs. Butterworth, who sh- who to him and to everybody else should be back in London, right? Right. And she just sort of floats in. Mm-hmm. The way she just calmly walks in with that little smile on her face that makes you want to s- – s- uh, sorry, uh, feminist – makes you want to slap it off her face, right? Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I – even then, I just – I found her to be – and the thing is, it just the sad part is, oh, you're number two, you know, because yeah. I found her charming and I found her and, and she's not I did too. She's not I the did, usual foil. I know. But that's no, I'm saying that. But no, that's why the ending is is great, because you feel betrayed. You know, mm-hmm. you wanted to believe that she was cool and a helper and everything. And it's it's compounded. It's not only, again, that she's part of the village, but she's number two. Mm-hmm. And she has the birthday cake to rub it in his face. <laughs> it's all, every last little bit of that is to rub in his face. The saving grace in that scene is that he gives her no reaction no. whatsoever. And I hope to goodness that in her head she's disappointed because she didn't get even a tiny little rise out of him because that's not our guy. He is that he that is not him, you know. Right. It's the it's the ending of James Big Ben. Right. He just gets up and walks back to his home. He throws a little "Be seeing you," and that's it, you know. There was something more crushing, though, about the end of Chimes of Big Ben compared to this. I agree. I I totally agree. Which is weird. Yeah. You shouldn't feel that way because Chimes of Big Ben was all simulated. This was, he was there. And yet I just, I don't know why. I almost. I I know why because of all these these problems that I have with this episode, (laughs) you know. I I don't like that he knows where the village is. I don't like it that he goes tries to go back to his old bosses when he when he shouldn't. I think it's too major of an operation, even more intense than Chimes of Big Ben, for little to no return. So what? You stuck a. You know, you stuck a sharp stick in his eye. So what? He pulls it out and sits back and heals and is ready to go another round. Yep. If anything, number one, and I'm talking to you, number one and number two, if anything, your little games serve to only strengthen his resolve. You know, I think they need to give up (laughs) (laughs) and either kill him or let him go. Right. But they can't let him go because they know he's going to, you know, come back. The funny thing is, is that when he gets in that jet and they're flying, you you wonder if he if there are missiles on that jet. What? But I don't think that was his intention. His intention was just to identify where the village is. Exactly. Go back to London and then arrange for the invasion <laughs> or destruction. I would assume it's going to be an invasion because I think not even our cold, you know, cold fish uh, number six would do a missile strike on a village with full of, uh, let's say it, innocent people. Are they innocent, though? I, I think that many many of them are. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't give a damn if number two and and his and her stupid green dome got blown to hell, <laughs> or the guys in the control room because they're 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 in on it, you know. Right. They know what's going on, but I don't think the admiral or the colonel or whoever that whatever the I colonel. you know I don't think the lady I don't think that some of the maids I don't think the guy in the shop the dancers on the boat. Yeah, <laughs> right. I don't think that they need to be blown to hell, you know. Right. But but I assume that that's his intention. He goes back. He says, it is right here, invasion force. 
and I'm going to be leading the charge because I want to see number two's face when we walk in there with troops, you know? Right. So, so that's it. That's it. I, I blew it, man. I, you know, I hope we get angry letters and emails and I posts. get the feeling most people will probably be like, yeah, maybe you went a little too hard on it there, but it's, it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not one of the better moments. It's, I it's, wish it's somebody, perfectly, I wish I knew there was one person out there who filled, feels the same way as I do uh, about, uh, especially about this, knowing where the village is. No, I'd like to know one person who thinks this is some sort of masterpiece. That's the person I'd like to meet who can really yeah. say, no, no, this does fit in with all this and it, and it makes perfect sense and blah, blah, blah. I, cause I, that, I'm not saying you're wrong, Jim. I just think, you know, wow, you're, you're being really harsh on this one. It's just, well, <laughs> it, I mean, I hope you, I hope you wouldn't say I'm wrong because it is no. my opinion. No, my I'm not opinion. saying you're wrong. I'm not saying yeah. you're wrong. I just think yeah. you're going about it just like, wow. Yeah. Okay. Cause I know there's going to be some other episodes coming down the line that I'm going to be a bit more harsh on and going this, this is just, it's there. It's, it, yeah. it's, it's literally that. And it's only worth it for the very end. I think there is some poor writing in this episode. Yes. Some, and that to me is a tangible thing, you know, that's maybe not just an opinion, mm-hmm. but, but I, again, I totally admit, uh, the thing about the location of the village is a personal thing. Okay. Um, no, and that's fair. I have felt that about many things that when I get a, a property introduced to me and the concepts are introduced to me, many times that's a kind of a like a written in stone kind of a thing. And when you start to violate those concepts of the, in the property, then you're you know you're breaking down what that property is is and and this is one of them i think that's a fairly sacrosanct thing of the location of the village and i'm i'm going off of the precedent set in previous episodes of we do not disclose where it is and we do we make sure that number six doesn't know where it is why now does it not matter that's what i want to know okay and you know what? Right. Okay. And if you're going to do those things, then tell me why or show me why. Again, I, d- you know, Chimes of Big Ben, yeah, we're going to demoralize him. But guess what? It didn't really work. Why do almost the same thing, but just ra- turn it up to 11 and, 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 and you get the same result, which is nothing? Hmm. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, again, not arguing. I just, yeah. yeah. I don't think, I think the writers didn't like, didn't think that through. They thought they had an incredible, cool concept. Oh my goodness. We're going to let him go all the way back to London. And he comes all the way back to the village without really thinking of what are the ramifications of that, you know? Right. I, oh, okay. <laughs> no, I just, I, you know, you, you, you are really, you really were affected by this. This really, yeah, I, 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 yeah. And you know what? When I started watching this, I go, oh yeah, that's this one. Uh, here we are. <laughs> I knew this all along, and I felt this way from the first time I ever saw it. I knew this episode existed. I know it's in the middle of the show. I know that I had problems with it. I wasn't necessarily looking forward to it. Hmm. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, I'm not sitting there telling you you're dead wrong. I just feel like, wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. It, that's okay. You know, um, some of our best podcasts in the past have been when we disagree. <laughs> <laughs> by, the, by the way, one last thing I just want to also point out because I didn't get to before. Our man Thorpe, played yeah. by Patrick Cargill, yeah, actually right. appears in another episode as well. He's a number two. In yeah. Hammer into Anvil. It, it, wait, he's number two in a very good episode. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to really like Hammer into Anvil. We'll see. And Hammer okay. into Anvil is actually my dad's favorite episode. Well, here's the, the thing. And, and yeah. we'll he's talk always about- said that I like that one 
where and he didn't know he doesn't know the title, but he he always describes it. I like that one where they you know the, he tries to drive them crazy and so, you know. Uh, I, I love that. And, and, and my late wife liked hammer into anvil also. Ah, well, cause and we're not going to answer that question now. We'll get to it when we get to hammer into anvil. I've mm-hmm. read in a few places when I was looking at this episode today, some people suggesting that Thorpe was in on this though. Maybe not the Colonel, but Thorpe was, and that he becomes number two. I just read, I just read that myself and I totally, totally, totally disagree with that. You know what? I think that's in the A&E booklet that they suggest that. And I do not believe that whatsoever. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get into it when we get to that yep. episode and we'll see if there's any hints there that could yep. possibly suggest where anybody gets that idea from, because I, I don't believe it just based on the surface of this. I think he's just as genuine as the Colonel in this. Yeah. Oh, you know what? It's on Wikipedia. Oh, okay. Where, they, where it says that about Thorpe. <laughs> yeah. I, it says, uh, supposing that Thorpe and number two are in fact the same character. Right. No, no, no. I, I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't either. I don't either. Yeah. Well, Loney. Yeah. Many happy returns. <laughs> Folks, let us know what you yes. think of, especially <laughs> this one, because we're, we're yeah. so, you know, I, and again, not disagreeing with Jim, just thinking, wow, you're being, am I being too easy on it? Is Jim being too hard? Is this a, a brilliant episode, you know, uh, with, with such <laughs> yeah, cinematic force that, that Magoo brought to it and such? Let us know by visiting us at chronicrift.com and commenting there on our Facebook page, The Chronic Rift, Chronic underscore Rift. You can leave comments there or you can write us to thechronicrift at gmail.com and let us know what you're thinking about this and any of the other episodes we've done. Stay tuned for all the other great programming here on the Chronic Rift Network. Until next time, this is your number two saying, be seeing you, Jim. Take care. Be seeing you. Once again, the prisoner has been foiled in his attempt to escape the far-reaching tentacles of the village. It might be illuminating here to briefly compare many happy returns with an earlier episode, The Chimes of Big Ben. In Chimes, number two concocted a scheme to convince our hero that he'd escaped to London, when in reality, he remained in the village. In many happy returns, however, the prisoner is a little wiser to the tricks of the village, and certainly wouldn't fall for the same trick twice. That's why this time it was necessary for them to actually allow him to escape, knowing full well his every move. This is the really chilling aspect of many happy returns, the fact that his captors were able to second-guess his movements so easily and to manipulate his apparent freedom so completely. One key question we might ask is, what exactly did the village gain with this elaborate and risky scheme? Their apparent purpose was to once again give him the false hope of freedom, Just like a fish on a line, they gave him slack, then reeled him in. But perhaps their true purpose lies deeper than that. 
They certainly forced him to discover that the old maxim, you can't go home again, really applies. He's as much an alien in his old world now as he is in the village. This is a theme that will be more strongly developed in future episodes. Now, we promised you a little biography of Patrick McGowan, and we deliver on our promises when it's convenient. Patrick Joseph McGowan was born on March 19, 1928, in New York City. When he was three, his parents, both Irish immigrants, moved back to Ireland, where the family stayed for many years. Patrick's theatrical career began not as an actor, but as a stagehand for the Sheffield Repertory Company in England. He eventually became an understudy and then a regular player, appearing in an average of 26 plays a year for 12 years. Now, how's that for paying one's dues? McGowan was 26 when he got his first movie role, playing alongside Richard Todd and Michael Redgrave in a World War II action flick called Dam Busters, as in, who you gonna call? Dam Buster, never mind. A string of other small roles followed. Passage Home in 1955, High Tide at Noon in 56, Hell Divers, The Dark Avenger, and The Gypsy and the Gentleman in 57 are some of the more memorable films he worked in. Perhaps the best of that period, however, was All Night Long, a jazz age update of Othello in which McGowan played a pot-smoking Iago. By this time, though, McGowan had already established himself as one of Britain's leading actors starring in a popular television series entitled Danger Man. In the United States, it was called Secret Agent, and with its seven-year run, McGowan's career was catapulted. At the time, he was Britain's highest paid actor, earning 2,000 pounds a week. His secret agent character, named John Drake, was originally conceived of as a television version of James Bond, complete with weekly gunfights and glamorous girls. But McGowan insisted that Drake is a moral fellow, and he reshaped the character from a clone of 007 into the upright agent with a conscience, which is what made the series a cult classic on two continents. During the run of Secret Agent, McGowan continued his film work, doing two films for Walt Disney, The Three Lives of Thomasina, in which he plays a rural veterinarian, and Dr. Sin, alias the Scarecrow of Romney Marsh, kind of a Robin Hood story. Growing tired of his obligations to Secret Agent, McGowan went to the president of ITC Entertainment, Sir Lou Grade, to discuss a new idea for a series that he and Secret Agent story editor George Markstein had developed. After he described the storyline of the proposed series, Lou Grade looked at him and said, I don't understand a word you're saying. How much will it cost me? McGowan provided a budget, ITC came up with the money, and the prisoner went into production the following Monday morning. After The Prisoner, McGowan's movie credits continued in 1967's Ice Station Zebra, The Moonshine War in 1970, and Mary, Queen of Scots in 1972. That same year, McGowan moved to California. Here he directed and starred in two episodes of Peter Falk's Columbo series, By Dawn's Early Light, which earned him an Emmy Award as Best Actor in a Supporting Role, an identity crisis, which is full of allusions to the prisoner. Once more, I'll be seeing you. Bye. In both these episodes, he plays the villain, a role he seems to relish these days. In Silver Streak, for instance, he plays art forger and murderer Roger Devereaux. In Brass Target, he's a conspirator, along with Man from Uncle Robert Vaughn, in a plot to assassinate General Patton. In Escape from Alcatraz, he plays opposite Clint Eastwood as the prison's cold-hearted warden. We don't make good citizens, but we make good prisoners. In Scanners, he's the misguided genius, Dr. Paul Ruth. And in Baby, he's the misguided anthropologist, Dr. Kiviet. A prisoner. We do not take prisoners. In between work on these and many other feature films, McGowan found time to return to television, first in a short-lived medical series on CBS entitled Rafferty, and more recently in a number of excellent made-for-TV movies, including The Man in the Iron Mask, Jamaica Inn, and Three Sovereigns for Sarah, part of the American Playhouse series on PBS. And he continues to keep in touch with his roots, acting on the stage in such plays as A Pack of Lies in New York. 
Next week, the prisoner is beside himself with worry as he meets his identical duplicate in The Schizoid Man. Until then, I'm Scott Appel, and I'll be seeing you. Thank you.